uh, those that are watching us, we are back, and this time we have a very important topic for our lives. We are talking about water, sanitation, and housing. It is said that water itself is what constitutes life. So water is equals to life. And that housing is about dignity. You can't talk about dignity without including the aspect of housing. And sanitation is survival. So again, we are dealing with relatively big ways. So there's the issue of life, there's the issue of dignity, and the issue of survival. That's what water, sanitation, and housing bring to us. This is a huge topic, and the uh, president of the social society, Dr. Fred Mbembe, is here. And we will try to break down this topic. Indeed, these are huge. You cannot have a dignified life without a solid roof over your head, without a proper dwelling. You cannot survive as a human being without water. You cannot have a health life as a human being without proper sanitation. So the house has to have water. The house has to have sanitation. Yes. Sanitation needs water. When you look at the conditions under which our people are living today, both in the urban areas and in the rural areas, they do not meet the requirements of a dignified life in the 21st century. Today, if you go into a compound, you go into garden, you look at the house, you go into many of our compounds in urban areas, you go to the rural areas, you look at where human beings emerge in the morning. And this is after 60 years of independence. And for a country that is endowed with everything that is required to build better houses, to provide better sanitation for our people. Many of our people today don't have where to sleep. If you go into our compounds today in Lusaka, especially, you will find a small room just a small room has got more than 10 people or so emerging from it. There's the father, the mother, the children, grown-up children, the grandchildren. sons and daughters, mm. and also grandchildren. The only thing that is separating the main bedroom is a chitenge from the last election campaigns. Chitenge is not sound. That Chitenge is transparent. You have children who have gone to, to who have finished school. They are sleeping. Want some the girls in this corner, the boys in that corner. The parents are there. Whatever is happening in that master bedroom of a Chitenge, an, an election campaign Chitenge. Those children are seeing and all are hearing. There is no privacy mm. for the parents. And the house, a house has to offer privacy. A house is not just roof and walls. A house is the most sacred, the most dignified place for human beings where a lot of things happen, where a lot of happiness should be made. Man and woman, wife and husband, deserve their privacy. They deserve their privacy not only from the outsiders, but also from the insiders of that house. That's the children, grandchildren, and others staying with them. 
you can't have a small room today packed with more than 10 or so people of different ages. Before you lose that track, traditionally, this was basically a taboo. What we did in our villages was normally you would have a small dwelling. That's where your father and mother were sleeping. And you nobody else. Nobody else. And as young men were told, you can't enter your daddy's bedroom, your mother's bedroom. It was forbidden. That is their privacy. And no one went to that bedroom. We were told as boys, you had your own small round hut somewhere. That's where the boys were. The girls had their own dwelling also. That was about privacy. They may not have constituted the modern day houses that we have in the urban areas, but privacy was a key issue. When gave you gave them a sense of dignity. Exactly. When you were a teenager, the first thing they told you was, you can't be here. You can't sleep in this house. You better build your own house. And that was one of the first survival skills that we were told, build your own house. And without that, the stresses are very high. It's not only the stresses about uh, electric electricity or load shedding. It's not only the stresses about lack of water. It's not only the stresses about sanitation, but also the stresses of lack of privacy, of enjoying a proper matrimonial life. That's very stressful to a human being. You find the people who wake up in the morning, they are angry. Because they are not having the privacy they deserve with their partners. So even as we design modern houses, if your modern house is not giving you the privacy, it doesn't give you the dignity that is required in life. It doesn't give you that privacy, that sense of children are here, the parents are here, visitors are allocated somewhere else. So housing is not just a structure. Housing is about privacy. Housing is about saying, this is the space where when everything else fails in life, I can retreat and have my peace and re-energize before I go out there in a certain place. We have not made progress in this area, in our country. We are actually retrogressing. The situation, comrade, you are talking about in the village, is, it was far much better than what we have today here. Both in the villages and in the urban areas, the situation is not getting better. I wonder how the situation will be in 15 years' time. When the population when, is going up. When the population will more than double. If we cannot house, properly house, 20.6 million people, how are we going to manage to house 40. 40 million plus people in 15 years' time. What programs do we have as a society, as a nation, to ensure that you know the 40 million human beings who occupy this territory who have a dignified life that comes from having the privacy of a home? You are raising something. The way the president talked about was programs. Housing just doesn't happen anyhow. Housing has to be planned. Housing has to be put in a space that is appropriate for housing. You can't build your houses where the water sources are, your aquifer. You can't do that. You can't build your houses on agricultural land. The land that's supposed to help you produce your crops, and then you put your houses there. You can't put your houses where there's absolutely no water, because that house is going to need water. So this is about planning. They call it country or urban planning. That's where you start from. So the 40 million people Zambia is going to have very soon have to be planned for. We have to know where the houses are going to be, where the water is going to come from, and where the forests, the green lands of the towns, of the villages, are going to emerge. And that must be thought of already, even before you put a house down. And we have done badly. Not just in constructing, before we even go to the issues of what are the challenges that face a developer? What are the challenges that face 
a human being, a worker, an ordinary Zambian, just the issue of can we plan for housing in the urban areas that is the region? From what you are saying, it's very clear that you know housing cannot be solved by an individual. Wonderful. It can't be left to an individual. Yes, the individual has to be involved. The community has to be involved. The whole nation has to be involved. There has to be leadership in housing. There has to be collective leadership in housing. Without that, you cannot solve the issue of housing. It's much more complex to leave it to an individual. It's not just about occupying a plot or being given a plot or stealing a plot. It's much more than that to achieve how proper housing. So in connection with what we said earlier, this is not an area you leave to politicians alone. It's true. Traditional leaders have to be involved. Everybody has to be involved. The business people have to be involved because also they provide the finance. They have to be involved. They have to be researchers. You can't just build anyhow. How is your community going to look like in 100 years if you don't plan it? If anybody just comes and puts up whatever they want, there's a shop here, there's a bar here, there's a house here, there's a feeding station here, mm -hmm. there's a farm here the, with, with the piggery and so on. How do you build like that? And certain questions have to be answered if we're building flat with the 20 million people, we have to think of going upwards now to accommodate a little bit more people. So we can't have the type of house that is there today. Let's take the city like Osaka. We have Kanyaringa, we have Kanyama, we have all these places. Even these so-called low desert residential areas, that's not the way to go anymore because unless you extend land, and that land is not infinity, it means also that even the thinking about housing has to change. It means that in a smaller space, we should be able to create enough decent housing. And that can only be done by changing the style of houses, by also ensuring that one space can accommodate several people. And I think that is very, very critical. That is very, very important. We have done and we have managed with a certain style of housing, with a certain way of building our cities. By that time, it's running very, very fast. It's running away. So today, if you take any town in Zambia, take Kitwe, Ndola, Lusaka, Livingston, Kabwe, these were towns that were appropriate, most likely, uh, for the 1960s. But today, your Lusaka, with more than two million people, Given the landmass that it has, the design has to look very different. The architectural uh, platforms and frameworks of the towns have to look very, very different. So science, technology, and thinking outside the box is something very, very critical when we talk about housing. What worked yesterday is not going to work today. Again, this is not a matter that can be left to the, to the individual alone to decide. You can't, as an individual, decide that I'm going to build my shop here. I'm going to start a school there. Bani pasa kaplota apa. So zama nga nyumba apa mena apa. Bani pasa kaplota apa. Ni zama nga po chipatara. Bani pasa kaplota apa. Ni zama nga po school. Bani pasa kaplota apa. Ni zai ka po ba. That must be decided by the planners of that area. It can't just be. And also, you will need to utilize land mm. carefully. Mm. Zambia is only 700. Give us the greenery. Give us the trees that we need for our oxygen to retain the water, to have sufficient rains. So that's why this cannot be a chipate pate type of arrangement. This must be planned. Land must be zoned. And we have to know this piece of land is a no-go area. This is where we need our trees to grow over the next 100, 200, 300 years to come. There may even be minerals, resources today, but we shall still say the damage 
of mining in Lower Zambezi today is going to be a disaster for future generations. This is a no-go area. Whatever resources are there, your copper that's being mined, that's going to be mined in there, it's not worth the damage, the trade-off weighs against opening a mine in such an environmental, ecological, sensitive area. So but, say but, no but, to but that. But that decision cannot be made by those who want to mine. The transitional, the transitional corporations and their agency here cannot be left to make that decision. They are there to maximize their profits. They don't care about the environment. It's the leaders of our communities, the leaders of our people, that need to make those decisions together with their people. Exactly. It can't be left to the, to, to, to the, to the exploiters, to the business people. The exploiters have no business supporting saving your country, saving your trees, saving your environment. That's not their business. They can pollute Kawe and it becomes the most toxic, highly polluted town in the whole world. They don't care. They don't live there. No. Those who started mining in Kawe, are they there? They are long gone. Do their families stay there? So are there any families of Sesu Roads in, in Kawe? So the issue again is the, issue, uh, the concept of land use has to go beyond one generation. It has to go. The Socialist Party in government will deal with that. One of our major tasks will be to reduce the production cost of cement or the cost of cement. And modern technology allows for small scale cement factories. We are not going to nationalize anything. We are not going to nationalize the cement factories people have built. But our people will be enabled. Our people will be helped to set up their own factories. Including our municipalities. Where there's municipalities, local government authorities, where there's private individuals, where there's cooperatives, where there's parastatos, those cement factories will be built. And it's not that expensive. You can go to Lusaka West today and see a Chinese factory that was built a few years ago. It's not such a big thing, but look at why, how much cement is coming out of there. And look at the production cost. The production cost is very low. When they started, they were selling cement at 40 kwacha, undercutting others who were selling at 60 kwacha at that time. And they were still making super profits. The production cost is far much, much lower than the 40 kwacha they were selling it at. They could have still money to sell at a price far much lower than 40 kwacha and still make super profits. Not just profits, but super profits. Our people can produce that and reduce the cost of producing cement. And if we reduce the cost of producing cement or the cement, the selling price of cement, Many people who afford cement and build better houses. It will improve the sanitation. We will improve our agriculture, the agricultural dams. We will be able to build the hydropower stations with cheap cement. We will be able to build roads, bridges, schools, hospitals. The whole system changes. Without reducing the cost of cement, you can't develop as a country. Exactly. The China we are admiring that has been built over a period of 40 years extensively. The cement price in China is far much lower than your cement price here. In many places, they are building concrete roads. Yep. They have stopped these roads we are building. They are building concrete roads. Why can't we build concrete roads? It's because the cement is expensive. If you have seen our roads where trucks stop and, uh, and so on. They are melting. They have built the roads at, that, uh, at, at those portions with the cement. That's where there's concrete, yes. Yes. If the cement was affordable, they, were, they could have built the whole road mm. with the cement. Mm. And those roads would last mm. and would be able to build more roads. With these current prices of cement, we can't build roads, we can't build bridges, we can't build hospitals, we can't build schools, we can't build our dwelling houses, we can't build irrigation dams, we can't build hydropower stations, we can't do much. So 
if cement is so important to the development of this country, why leave it completely in the hands of foreigners? And a few foreigners for that matter. Now, there was the argument that we got one time when we were saying as a socialist government, we will ensure literally every district, every province has got one form or the other of a cement factory to cut down on the costs. Then we're being accused of being anti multinationals, anti these big cement factories. The argument was that if we did that, we would be chasing away these big our, multinationals. Our main objective is not to enrich transnational corporations. Our main objective is to give our people a better life. That's yeah, our primary objective. Yeah, to give our people a better life. If we can give our people a better life by enriching transnational corporations, then we'll do it. But it hasn't happened uh, since the 1930s, 1940s. So we have to change. We are not against multinational corporations. We are for our people. Our people should benefit. Our people should live better. If by giving our people a better life, it gives the transnational corporations bigger profits, we have no problem with it. But the primary objective of everything that is being done in this country is to improve the living conditions of our people, to give our people a dignified life. And a dignified life for a socialist is access to clean water, a solid roof over your head, access to education, health access to health services, and all the services required in an organized society. That's what socialism is. It's not about these bombastic words, no. Mm. So cement is a key input in the construction of our dwellings, of our housing, and it is unaffordable currently. We'll bring it down. But there are other inputs also. Uh, today, if you are constructing a house in South Africa, Your total cost compared to that of a Zambian, same house, same quality, is only 60%. So Zambians pay 40% more constructing a house than South Africans. If you get into Tanzania, you are in Dar es Salaam, Morogoro, Arusha. You can construct a house 50% cheaper than constructing that house in Zambia. The local businessmen figured it out, actually. So you can get building materials from South Africa, bring here, and make a big saving. You can buy your building materials from Tanzania, and not even the wholesales. You go to Kariako, that open market there in Dar es Salaam, get your building materials, put them on Tazara, bring them here, and make a saving. So what does that tell us? What it tells us is that despite all these distances, logistics you have to cover from South Africa, from Tanzania, later on from China, bringing containers full of building materials from China, you bring it in Zambia, you are making a saving. So the cost of building materials in Zambia is just unacceptable. It's exorbitant, and this is killing Zambians. People are making business out of it. The so-called rich people in Zambia are nothing other than traders, middlemen, that are basically exploiting this gap. So we are talking about cement, but cement is not the only one. Today, even making doors in Zambia or buying doors in Zambia is very expensive because of the huge profits that are put. And these are wooden doors. They are not metal doors. They are not steel doors we are talking about. These are wooden do doors. From hardwood that nobody planted, God gave us for free. Give thanks. He gave us for free. Well, how much does it cost to cut a tree and make a door out of it? Why should a door with Zambian wood be so expensive, be beyond the reach? of our people. That you can get it from Zimbabwe cheaper than getting it from Zambia. Yes. 
Again, these are issues the socialist government will pay attention to. So, apart from the issue of building materials, let's go to the skills. Those of you that have tried to build houses, at times you are better off hiring your brother from Congo to do the work for you. Hiring your brother from Zimbabwe to come and do the finishing of your house. Getting somebody from Tanzania to come and ensure that your house looks decent. Where have we gone wrong? Why are our skills so poor that today the majority of our people don't have these basic skills, bricklaying, carpentry, plumbing skills that this country used to have some time back? And when we talk about some time back, we're not just talking about maybe 60 years ago. In 1890, Lewanika built his house, Wandu, mm. in Lealui. Mm. If you go and see what structure was built by Lewanika in 1890, you'll be shocked. It's far much superior to what we have today. Mm. With local materials, and the designing was done, for those who know some grasses in Western Province, was done with Mambumwe. Mm joining them. And Lewanika was the architect, the main architect. That Kwandu still stands out today. It still stands out if you go and see it. There was brilliance. There were geniuses. If our ancestors can build such houses in 1890, a house that is still standing today is solid. It's still solid. Built in 1890, still solid. You go to Kazembe and see the house that was built, the palace that was built in 1945. Look at the quality of that palace in Kazembe. Just look at the quality in 1945. Go to Limulunga and see the house that was built in 1932. Look at the quality. It still stands, no cracks. Both the Kazembe and the two houses I'm talking about in, Western Prov in, in Barozland or Western Province, they are still intact, no cracks. Where did the skills come from? They were not built by foreigners, they were built by our own people, supervised by our leaders. Today, in the 21st century, with all our educated people, so many construction engineers. We can't build better houses for ourselves at a reasonable cost. Look at the quality of housing that you, people are living in. I have the privilege of having an office in Garden in Mandevu constituency of Lusaka. I've moved around the compounds of Lusaka. You look at the toilets. Just toilets, the way they are built. Petra trains, these are Petra trains. In some cases now, we can't, even, I don't know even what to call them. Because a Petra train, you need to dig a pit. That's it. In some of our places in Lusaka, you can't dig. You dig just up to your knees, there's water. If you go to Cabanana. There's water. So our people have stopped digging. Petra trains, they just so build they, walls. They raise it up. Yes. And then put steps. And put a, a small roof there. When you are going to the toilet, it's like you are climbing in Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> yeah? And the children who are playing there are laughing at you. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Where is human dignity? We can't build proper toilets. Where are our technicians? Where are our engineers? Where are our country planners? Where are our leaders, our political leaders? You know, when Michael Sata used to talk about toilets all the time, when I was a journalist, I used to wonder, why is this man so obsessed with toilets? Later on, when I got into the political life and started moving in these compounds, I realized 
what the big problem Michael was talking about. I had to use these Petra trains. I had to climb these climb, Mount, 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 the Kilimanjaro's. I had to be laughed at by children coming out of there. Surely this is not the way to go. In the 1920s, 30s, the colonial government actually instituted certain bylaws where they basically forced us to construct pit latrines. And they even set standards. So for a certain period of time, the pit latrines improved a little bit. Over the past, I would say, 40 years or so, there have been the worship programs, there have been the issue of uh, uh, ventilated uh, VIP pit latrines and so forth. But the villages we go to, the villages we sleep in, it looks like that whole progress is not there. The rural areas of Zambia, 10 to 20 percent, depending on which area you are in, they still do open defecation. Western provinces is, is very poor in that. It's still predominantly open defecation. So even the pit latrines that are there, they leave much to be desired. When it is raining, that's one of the most difficult assignments that you have in life, to be able to help yourself. And this is 60 years after independence. Where is human dignity? Where is the planning? Where are the concepts for that dignified living? And this is where the Socialist Party says, if we have to fail, let's fail on more comp but not on basic issues of housing, of sanitation, of providing water to our people. Because without that, really, life is not that pleasant. And I think a good number of you that have been in the rural areas, that are still using the ordinary pit latrines. It's actually a task, it's an exercise. And the older you grow, the more difficult it becomes, actually, because the squatting part of it, your knees, the pain that endures there, is not a joke at all. So we can do better, and we must do better. But things don't happen from nowhere. We must plan things. We must resource them. So our skills are poor. We have to train people. Our training institutions, we are now doing everywhere marketing, human resource management. That's all well and good. But you need good artisans. At village level, you should be able to say, within these 10 villages, we have a super bricklayer, a plumber. We have a good carpenter. These are basic skills of life, without which no community can prosper. We have neglected that. That's why we are importing labor now, skills, from Congo, from Tanzania, from Zimbabwe from South Africa. So if our people are not able to have those skills, which skills do we have then? Those who went to school in the 50s, 1950s, will tell you that they do, they do not just learn arithmetic. They just didn't learn English. But they actually also learned even how to construct houses. A number of these schools you see, they were not just constructed by contracted workers. The learners themselves were part and parcel of the construction teams. So that by the time the school was built, these young people that attended those schools knew how to construct their own houses. So school has to be meaningful. It has to be brought to reality with the lives people are going to live. You go to school for 12 years and you can't construct a pit latrine. So what is that school about? We have to change. And that change is a must. We talked about financing. Indeed, any project, any program needs financing. Housing needs specialized financing. And as a country, we have retrogressed. If you talk about getting funding to build your house today in Zambia, we are in shambles. You cannot build houses without money. You can't. Even if you bring down the cost of building, you still need some money. You still need some money. What financial institutions are there to give our people money to build their own homes? 
or to give collectives of our people like cooperatives and so on money to build housing units. What financing is there? The financing that is there is expensive financing. Most of these houses you see in Rusaka and other parts of the country are not built from financial institutions dealing with housing. Some of it is stolen public money. Yeah, and most of it actually is stolen public money. Some of it, you know, is workers and other people who have struggled for years to finish a house. They have literally done nothing in their lives with their incomes other, other than to build house. that house. They have suffered for that house. And a good number of them, they retire, they put all their life's earnings in a house. And that stress is so much, you retire two years down the road, the house is finished, and you are gone. We bury so, you. Sometime, you your house sometimes behind. before even they die, because of financial pressure, they go to the bank or to some money lender. They mortgage that house. And before they die, that house is taken away from them, a house that they have built over their whole working life. It's taken away. And when it's taken away, most of them, we have some people who have committed suicide. Exactly. We have some people who have gone into depression and died. Some people, hypertension, shoot up and they die. Just over a house. Should a house take so much of a person's energy, a person's time, Definitely, we have a crisis in housing. But we don't seem to be a nation that is acting to that crisis or is recognizing that there's a crisis here and is taking measures to deal with a crisis. Crises require a certain level of urgency. Exactly. Crises require some planning to deal with them, some mobilization to deal with the crisis. When there's a crisis, you mobilize for that crisis. Exactly. We are not mobilizing for the housing crisis. We are taking it as a normal thing, or what they now call the new normal. Mm. It's okay for 10 people, 15 people to live in a small house, mm. a small room, with a toilet very far away, a pitra train very far away. We, we have taken that as normal. We don't realize that this is a crisis. People can't live that way. The socialist government will take housing as a serious crisis that needs to be dealt with. It will take sanitation as a serious crisis that needs all the agents. It will take water as a very, very serious crisis that needs to be dealt with in the most urgent way possible. Mm. So, again, financing cannot be one size fits all. The financing needed for housing is highly specialized. It has to suit the requirements, the income levels of our people. Our people spend quite a lot of their years working, whether they are farmers or they are in jobs, and many times they make contributions. They pay to something called a pension. But by the time they retire in their 50s or 60s, that pension is not sufficient to build them a house. At the same time, their pension money is the one that is building these nice malls. malls where they don't sleep. Around. Exactly. Where they don't get jobs. Where they are not allocated shops. Where they don't even shop because they can't afford it to shop there. Part of the socialist concept is when you are making contributions to your pension, you can already get that to become part of a mortgage arrangement. So basically, from day one when you start, you can already start applying or going over and arrange for, to start building your house. I would even say before you buy your car, first get a roof over your head. Have something. You are in your 20s and 30s, would like to see young Zambians recently graduating 
talking about, this is my flat. I'm on the fourth floor, I'm on the fifth floor, I've got but, a two-bedroom flat. But brother, before they even start thinking about building, they needed to have somewhere where they are living to think that way. So housing comes in many forms. Exactly. There's housing that the individual has to build for himself or herself. Mm. There's housing that the private individuals build to rent to others. There's housing that cooperatives build for their members and also for, rental to, for rentals to others. Exactly. There's also buildings or housing that has to be provided by the local authorities. The local authorities cannot move out of housing completely. There will be a certain section or a certain population that needs that housing. There's also housing that the national authorities need to provide. To provide. We have also our brothers and sisters who are in institutions or in professions that does not give them that much time. If you take care of our brothers and sisters who are in the military, mm. they don't have time to start getting plots here and there to build. Queuing for those plots. Queuing for those plots. They are on the move, some of them, all the time. How do they build? Our police officers. Our police officers and so on. There has to be building housing schemes that cater for their special circumstances. Mm. 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 And so on. Young people can't come from college, from university, and be on the street. No. They can't also go back to that one room in, in Kalingalinga or in garden with their father. When you come out of college, you go your own path. You can't go back home. Today, we have so many young people who are not graduating from their parents' homes. They graduate from college, but they don't graduate from the home. They come and sleep where they used to sleep before as, they went as, to university. As kids. They start producing children, children in their father's house, mother's house. Someone is 40 years. The wife is in that bedroom that was meant for him as a child. Yes. And the children are also being grown up there. Yes. Sleeping in the same room where you were sleeping as a child. Now you are with your family there. And for that matter, you are working. Yes. But that job is not offering you the opportunity to be able to even, rent or even to build your own. Now we have a situation now which nobody is paying attention to. There's a, a crisis with the rented accommodation. Mm. Many of our people in these compounds are failing to pay the rentals. They are moving from one landlord to another to another and shift at night. When the landlord is sleeping, they start taking their katundu out and run away, leave the keys in the door. They stay there for two, for two months or three months in a new place. Again, they run away. When they meet by accident with the former landlord, there's a fight at the market. You can't live like that. Mm. But this is the situation. Our people just can't, can't manage if in total for the balance. At Vintu, we have voter, civil balance. Kutari Tabu. Mongirao, Kuma Girao, Kuma Siviku Manap. No, look, if you have to pay the rentals, then you have electricity problems, you have water problems, you have food problems. Put the order of priority. Wonderful. Put the order of priority. You end up running away from paying rentals. Because you have to eat. Yes. It's not that people are crooks. No, the tenants are not crooks. Those who are running away from landlords are not crooks. If you don't fish you pay. So again, housing needs planning. And if a person doesn't have a house where they are settled, they wake up tomorrow, there's nobody, you know, they are scared off. Not you hear a knock on the door, you are worried that the landlord now has some fire rentals. Can you think properly? A person who can, you are scared of going home. Yeah? You are scared of going home because you don't have a home. Hmm? So again, housing needs planning. There are things that can 
there are things that must be done in the medium term. There's also action to be taken today that has an impact in the long term. Even people that are trying to build, they face huge challenges. There are basics that the president has alluded to that can be done, that can be accomplished today. If we are going to rely on individuals going their own way, it's chaotic, it's a mess, it's too expensive. They have to build a road to that plot. So roads have to be built. And By the individual. Are a social, it's a sunk cost. Then they have to supply their the, own water. The utilities, water. And then you have to drill your borehole. You are drilling this borehole in this small thing. Plot. And then you have your sewer system mm, there, right up there, not even 30 meters away. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sewer is entering your borehole. They visit each other. They have, have, they have become relatives. And you have spent hundreds of thousands of quachas on that. Things can't work that way, Vane. And sometimes where your plot way. is, there's no water. Exactly. You keep on it reading, you pay, but there's no water. Make so this is a crisis. Housing is a crisis in terms of planning, in terms of how it is done in this country. We have talked about the skills, even basic skills, just to give ourselves affordable, decent housing. We are losing it. No direction, no planning. Financing is chaotic, it's non-existent. It's one of the most confused areas of our lives. Housing matters, but we have failed lamentably. If we had to grade ourselves as a society out of 10, we would give ourselves 0 0.5 out of 10. That's how miserable we have performed. And the current government is not an exception. Again, I wanted to emphasize, we have a serious housing problem today. But we'll have even a more serious housing problem soon, soon in the next 10 to 15 years when our population doubles, or more than doubles. If we can't provide our people with housing today, when they are 20.6 million, how are we going to manage to provide them with housing when they are 40 million plus in 15 years' time? And again, I emphasize 15 years is not very far away. It's not very far away. You are talking of two or three regimes or five years. Mm. So, the president, let's shift a little bit to water. Water is also pathetic in terms of availability of safe, reliable drinking water in Zambia. The statistics are that as of four or five years ago, 47% of our people in the rural areas had no access to clean water. 47% of our people. In the urban areas, the statistics were saying 10% of our people had no access to clean water. But things have changed drastically also here. In the urban areas, out of the 90% they said have got access 70% of that, their water is unreliable. So they have access, but very intermittent, very unreliable access. Meaning that water, you can get it maybe once in a week, or twice in a week, or even in months you don't have water. But it's still written as if you have access to clean water. As of the beginning of this year, that figure... would say in a place like Lusaka, 85% of our
it's not reliable. The, the outcomes are quite clear. Cholera will not go away. Typhoid will not go away. All these waterborne diseases are going, actually, uh, to be with us for years and years to come. But not only that, water is going to be expensive. Water has become expensive because you have a few people that have their own boreholes. They are selling water now. You have a few people that are producing water to drink. And the price of drinking water is becoming expensive. But it's expensive in the sense that at household level, when you are not able to wash properly, to cook properly, and to maintain levels of hygiene because there's no water, it becomes an expensive medical bill. That's where we are today as a country. Comrade, the capital city itself, Lusaka, most of these compounds are full of water wells. In a garden, a banana, and so on. They are drawing water from wells. They are still drawing water from wells. As you said earlier, there's a water well here, there's a pitra tree there. If in Lusaka people are still drawing water from wells, what more other far-flung areas? We have traveled this country. You look at the water that people are drinking, which you are forced to drink. When you travel, sometimes, you know, the, the first day you still have your bottled water that you have carried. But by the second day, it's finished. You are forced to drink that water. Water that looks like milk. Mm. It looks like milk. And the copper bill at times looks like coffee. Yes. And that's the water you have to drink. That's the water you have to bath. You have come from bathing, but you are dead because the water that you are bathing is dead. At times it's slimy, sort of. Like yes. Your skin is... Uh... Sometimes it's clay. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And that's the water also where animals drink. <coughs> You are sharing with your cattle, your goats, and everything. This is the situation we are in. Again, this is a crisis. So the, and it needs crisis management. The, the irony about it is that we are not investing in water. We are not. Even the bit of investments that you see around in most cases, it's borrowed. Just like we are reckless with our health, where very critical interventions are donor funded and so forth, we are not doing it differently when it comes to water for the urban areas and even for the rural areas, where you are told government is coming <coughs> in. In most cases, the majority of the cases, you find that this is your Millennium Challenge account that is going to, that's Americans by the way. They are the ones now giving you the money to work on Kafue Waterworks. Those in Lusaka might not know what Kafue Waterworks is, but that's your primary source of water. If I mean in Lusaka, Manzi, Ambiri, I mean it now Muno. I took a look few work. So they are pumping stations in Kafue. Then there are pipes, big pipes. The one you see on the road as you go to Kafue, there are big pipes on your left-hand side. That's the water coming from the Kafue River, one of the most highly polluted rivers in Africa because of the mines, reckless pollution um, activities of the mines with heavy metals. That's the water that's being pumped from Kafue. That's the one that's feeding Lusaka. Now, when it gets in, into Lusaka, we came up, or Zambia came up, uh, with what are called the water utilities. Water utilities are companies that today provide water for an entire province. From the economies of scale part of it, it makes sense. From the engineering, technical concepts, it makes sense that you have an organization that's responsible for coordinating the supply of water, generation and supply of water. Because it's, it's expensive. It has to be funded. But that funding, we have left it normally 
either to the Americans, the Millennium Challenge Account, we have left it to the Africa Development Bank, we have left it to many World Bank and so forth. These are the entities that we have been talking to. We are not seeing it as our first priority in terms of our funding, our capital investments that go. We leave that to well wishers. Yes. When the so-called donors. So what happened again was that our distribution system started breaking down because from the investments that we made in the 1960s and early 1970s, we went to sleep as a country. In the late 70s, 80s, 90s, we didn't seriously invest in our water infrastructure. So even today, 25 to 35% of the water that is generated, that is pumped, gets lost. It gets lost because you have an old piping system. Pipes only last that long. They can't last you 50 years, 60 years. So there are leakages everywhere. And when you have got leakages, it means also that part of the water gets polluted, gets contaminated. And this is water that you have already treated somewhere, but because of the leakages in the piping system, that water gets contaminated and it comes to the household level. So you end up having less water and very poor quality water because of the system that we are using. We are not investing. What would investing mean? If we spent today 10% of the national budget ensuring that the water supply system is working, would make huge progress. And that's what the Socialist Party is going to do. Secondly, there are basic repairs that must be undertaken. The network is obsolete, the network is terrible, and because of that, some of these investments that are being made in storage are not yielding the results. Those of you that have seen those huge tanks in Chelston, they have been built there over the years. You build one tank, pump in millions of dollars, and Chelston doesn't have the water. You put in another one again, pump in the money, Chelston doesn't have the water. Simply because you are dealing with one aspect but leaving out many other aspects of water distribution system. Modern technology, whether you like it or not, can be helpful. With simple valves, sensors, you are able to tell where the water is moving, at what speed the water is moving. If there's a leakage, pang, you sense it, the leakage is here. Interventions must be carried out. This line to that line, this must be redone. And also you plan, you invest in ensuring that your water recirculation system is at work at all given moments. You should never fail water. It just It's so important, an aspect of our lives. It should not break down at any given moment. Because when it breaks down, you kill people. When it breaks down, industry stops. When it breaks down, our household come to an end. They stop functioning without water. So investments are important. Planning is important for water. And the whole system of repairs has to be conducted. Using modern technology is equally important. That will ensure that at least the breakages and the repairs are better targeted. But we have to fund it ourselves. The money has to come from us. We can't delegate this to other people. We can't delegate this to donors. We can't delegate this to grants and even loans that we get to ensure that our water system is functioning. We have failed our Zambian people. The previous governments have failed. That's why we always advocate our Socialist Party will be the first ones to redeem Zambians out of this poverty. Not having people is poverty. It's one of the worst forms of poverty that you can ever experience. And that's why we are here. That's why we are saying the Socialist Party is the solution to the water problems of our people. Because the previous governments have failed. They have experimented in so many ways, but they are not interested in the masses of our people. The rich Zambians are finding their own solutions. They are drilling their boreholes, and so forth and so forth. But if you are poor, drilling a borehole, putting a submersible pump, putting your tank there, that's minimum your 80,000 kwacha, your 100,000 kwacha. And if you do something higher, 
just 120, 150,000 kwacha. Now, if your salary is 2,000 kwacha, when, how are you going to afford 120, 150,000 kwacha? President, in the abundance of water, we are thirsty. Our homes have no water. God has given us the rivers, the lakes, the streams, and abundant underground water. But we still don't have water in our homes. Watila le sata pela kuminu apalami kafi. Lesa na tu palami kafi onse. God will not move that water from the lake or from the river into your home. That has to be done by yourself. And thus, that needs leadership. That needs organization. If we don't organize ourselves, we don't create the leadership that can organize that and lead that process. This water will be moving from the Kafue River into the Zambezi River and all the way to the Indian Ocean. As Comrade KK used to say, laughing at us. If you pull it. Indeed, Wupuba. Wupuba high grade. You have so much water that is going into the Indian Ocean. Some of it into the Atlantic through Wapula and the Congo. We have no water. We are crying about water every day. What do you want God to do? To create streams into the homes. It won't happen that way. We need to construct a leadership that can deal with these challenges that we face. You cannot have socialism without water. You cannot have socialism without proper sanitation. You cannot have socialism without proper housing. Socialism is about human dignity. And this is what constitutes, in some way, human dignity. Mm. Mm. So, as socialists, we are guided. There are certain concepts that guide us. We believe, when you talk of water, sanitation, housing, the word sustainability must be there. Sustainability, so that as you put your housing, your water, your sanitation, you are thinking in terms of there will be 250 million Zambians one day. Land is not infinity. Land is still the same, but our numbers are going to grow. So whatever we do in those areas, this has to be sustainable. We have to ensure Zambia can still stand, Zambians can still live, the environment will still be there to support our lives. The second word that guides us as socialists is, is affordability. A lot of what we have talked about here is affordability. And in terms of affordability, let us use the state of the art technology. Ensure that our people are able to construct houses, to rent houses. Our people can have access to clean water at affordable prices. And that is key for us. The third word that we normally use is the issue, the issue of science and technology based. There are aspects of our lives where you need heavy investments in science and technology. Water, housing, sanitation are some of that. Especially when you talk of recycling. How do you recycle your water? We are losing a lot of water. Even the water that is like the gray sector, the one that we use for household use, we just splash it, it goes off, and it's not recycled. The water in the drainages of Lusaka, how are we capturing? Where are those ponds or pools where we are collecting that water? Yeah, we have a blue lagoon somewhere near Chawama there. You need 10, 15 of those around the city. This is where your water is stored, it's recycled, and this is the one you use to irrigate your gardens, 
to wash your cars, and even just to make the whole city look greener. Lusaka is dirty, Lusaka is dusty, simply because we don't have those green lungs that you need for a modern day city. So you need that water that is collected, that is recycled, and you ensure that that is helpful. And it's helpful in the sense that by that green also, you are retaining more water, more clean water. And with the greenery that is there, the air is much more fresh that is there in your city. So you can't do one without the other, and you need science and technology to do that. But we also think that as we move forward, there are opportunities for business. Zambian-owned businesses, whether it's parastatal, whether it's private, cooperative, there are businesses, business opportunities in water, sanitation, and housing. And those business opportunities have also to make social sense that Zambians have to benefit from the businesses that arise in those areas. Last but not least, an issue that has been coming up is inclusiveness. You can't talk about water, sanitation, and housing without that inclusive approach to governance. We have talked about the inclusive approach to governance where all stakeholders get involved. And that is key in attaining the success that we are going to talk about. And if we have a message, again, the last message to send to the Zambians, to the people that are listening to these programs, what is this message on these three issues? Let's plan for tomorrow as we live for today. We have no time to lose. We have a crisis. We revolutionaries and all other serious leaders of our people work for the future without neglecting the present. We can put boreholes at our own houses. That is, not, that is not solving the problem of water. We need a collective approach in terms of decision making, in terms of building the water systems of our, of our country. Again, this will not do without leadership. This is not something that will just come and drop from the skies. We have to plan it we have to execute it ourselves. We ourselves. What we can't do for ourselves, no, no. donor, no... ...of life. You cannot have dignified life again without water, without proper sanitation, and without proper housing.